All right, hi everyone. Welcome to our ANC seminar. And today we're very happy to have our own Nathan Harms um, to talk about VC dimension and distribution-free sample-based testing. Okay, um, Nathan, take it away. All right, thanks, Raphael. Uh, right, okay, so yeah, I'll talk today about uh, our paper, uh, VC dimension and distribution-free sample-based testing, uh, which will appear at uh, Stock 2021. Uh, and this is joint work with my advisor, Eric Blay, uh, and with uh, Renato Ferreira Pinto Jr., uh, who exists at the moment only within Zoom. Uh, so he gets a laptop portrait here. Uh, okay, so there's uh, two major kinds of algorithms uh, that we like to think about uh, in computer science. So one is a search problem output a solution to the problem. And the other is a decision problem. So just decide if there exists a solution to the problem or not. Uh, and in this talk, I'm interested in how these two types of algorithms are related to one another. And specifically, I'm interested in one special kind of search problem, which is uh, pack learning. Uh, and pack learning uh, is defined this way. So we have a set H, sometimes called the hypothesis class of uh, functions. Uh, and for this talk, we're going to be concerned with functions that take Boolean values, 0 and 1. Uh, and they have some domain x. And the input is going to be some parameter epsilon, which is the, the error, uh, and some function from our hypothesis class. Oh, can you guys see the cursor? Or is there a special button that I have to push? Um, we can see it. Oh, you can see the cursor. Okay, great. Um, uh, so, okay, yeah, a function in the hypothesis class and some probability distribution d over the domain x. Uh, but our access to the input is that the algorithm only gets to receive pairs of x uh, and the function value at x, uh, where x is sampled from this distribution. Uh, and the output of the algorithm should be another function in the hypothesis class. So here we're talking about proper learning. Uh, so a function in the hypothesis class that's very close, so within epsilon distance of the uh, input function f, uh, meaning that the probability that the function will differ from the actual function uh, is at most epsilon. And we want it to succeed with probability at least 2 thirds. Um, this constant is a little bit arbitrary, uh, but we can think of it as 2 thirds. Uh, so two important properties of this kind of algorithm is that it's distribution free. So it works for any unknown input distribution uh, and it's sample based. It only receives random examples of the function. So for example, it can't make queries. It can't make up a point X and query the function at value X. Um, okay, so now what is the associated decision problem for this? Uh, so remember a decision problem is like decide if there exists a solution to the problem. So our, our learning algorithm is finding a solution, which is finding a function in the class uh, that describes the data with high probability. Mm -hmm. And so we want our decision problem to decide whether or not such a solution exists. So again, we have this set of functions and we have as input uh, uh, this error value epsilon and a function, but this time the function is not necessarily in H. Uh, and then a probability distribution over X. And again, our access to the input is just we receive pairs uh, x and the value of x where x has been sampled from d. And now the output is going to say, we want the algorithm to say yes if the function is uh, within the hypothesis class, and no if every function in the hypothesis class is at least epsilon far. So this is what I mean by epsilon far. A random sample is going to disagree uh, with probability at least epsilon. Okay, so this time we, we have, uh, it's kind of asymmetric. We have to output yes if the function is in the class and no if the function is far from the class. And if it's between those two things, we don't really care uh, what the algorithm does. Okay. Um, and now again, importantly, we want this to match up with the pack model, which means that we want the algorithm to be distribution free again. So it works for any unknown input distribution D, and we want it to be sample based. So it receives only uh, random examples. Um, and so the question is, when is this testing problem, this distribution free sample based testing, when is that easier than 
pack learning. And by easier, I just mean here uh, that it requires fewer samples. So we're not concerned with the time complexity uh, of the algorithms right now. Uh, and this question was asked by uh, Goldreich, Goldwasser, and Ron in their uh, foundational paper on property testing. Uh, and they noted that in that paper, uh, this model, this distribution-free sample-based model is essential for some of the potential applications that they described in that paper. And now they didn't only talk about this model, they talked about many other models and, and a lot of research and property testing is about other models. Uh, so we're interested in this specific model, the distribution-free sample-based testing. Uh, and so there's been lots of recent attention. Uh, so this has been, seems to be increasing in popularity uh, on distribution-free and sample-based testing, testing uh, not necessarily both at the same time. Uh, but despite that recent attention, there is still no answer for some pretty basic questions about this model. So one basic question that we do have an answer for uh, is testing ever easier than learning? So is it, is it ever possible to have a distribution-free sample-based tester uh, that is more efficient than the associated learning problem? And they answered in the original paper, they answered yes. So it can actually be that we have a constant number of samples for testing, but the learning uh, algorithm has to sample essentially the entire uh, input. Um, but basic question two, and this is kind of surprising, we thought uh, that there's not really an answer for this, is are there any natural properties? So there's, there's one property where testing is much easier, um, but this, this is specifically constructed to uh, have the maximum gap here. And so we are wondering, well, what about natural properties? Properties that somebody might actually be interested in uh, applying an algorithm for, um, where testing can be done easier uh, than the associated learning problem. Um, and our answer is yes. Uh, the, the classes of juntas and monotone functions both satisfy this. So for both of these properties, we can actually get distribution-free sample-based testers uh, that are uh, much more efficient than the, than the learning algorithms. Uh, and that's in this work, but I'm not going to be talking about these results uh, in this talk. This talk is going to be on the uh, lower bounds only. Um, and the third basic question is half spaces are one of the central objects in learning theory. They're one of the most fundamental uh, classes of functions. Can they be tested more efficiently than they can be learned? Uh, so this, uh, we still didn't have an answer for that. Uh, so just to go into that question a little bit in more detail, uh, what's a half space? A half space is a function uh, that goes from n-dimensional space. Uh, and here we'll just use plus minus one instead of zero and one. Return to and, and it's just defined this way. It's the sign of a linear function. Okay, so basically we've got this Rn space uh, and we draw a hyperplane through the space and everything on one side gets a value one and everything on the other side gets a value minus one. So first, to answer our question uh, is, can we test faster than we can learn? We should know how many samples are required for learning. Uh, so let's look at the answer for this, which is pretty common knowledge. Uh, well, we've got a, th a fundamental theorem of PEC learning that says that for any hypothesis class, uh, and if we fix some constant epsilon, then we require roughly VC dimension uh, samples, a VC dimension of, of the class H. So let's just review what the VC dimension is. Uh, we say a set X is shattered by the hypothesis class if every possible labeling, binary labeling of those points uh, agrees with some function in the class. So here in this picture, I've got two, uh, I've got one a set of points here uh, and two different labelings. So for, for any labeling, so for this labeling, let's imagine these dotted lines are like the function in the class. Uh, and they separate the, the black points from the white points here. Um, and the same goes for this labeling. So no matter what labeling of these points that I choose, there's going to be some class in H that separates the two colors. Uh, and the VC dimension is just the maximum size of a set that can be shattered uh, by the hypothesis class. So what's the largest set of points so that any labeling of those points is achievable or realizable 
by one of those functions in that class. Um, and so for learning half spaces, we just have to compute the VC dimension, which is very well known, uh, which is n plus one. So uh, this requires uh, linear and n samples. So we have our first answer, we have our benchmark. Uh, so now we want to ask how many samples are required to test half spaces. Uh, so our first answer is just going to be at most order n. And the reason is because of this fundamental fact uh, observed uh, by this uh, original paper there, that testing this hypothesis class requires at most order of the proper learning cost plus one over epsilon. So the proper learning cost is, is how many examples are required for the proper learning algorithm. Um, and this is kind of in any model, basically. So if you have a learning model that uses adaptive queries or non adaptive queries or samples or whatever, then you can use that uh, to get this upper bound here. And the proof is, is essentially learn and verify. Just learn uh, the function if, if possible, and then check that you learned it correctly. Uh, so just a remark here uh, is that the above reduction is two sided error. So there might be false positives and false negatives just uh, by analysis of this reduction. Uh, but we can actually get uh, this order of VC dimension upper bound on one sided error testers. So that uh, um, there's only false uh, positives. Uh, and we show that in this work, but a little asterisk there because actually this follows from pretty standard uh, VC dimension techniques. So um, it's uh, not, not, that, uh, not that big of a result here. Um, so, so we have our first answer. We have an upper bound on testing. So let's ask about a lower bound. So, well, okay, so shouldn't this be at least linear in N, right? This is what, what, uh, what you might think approaching this problem. Uh, and why is that? Well, every set S of size N plus one that's in general position is shattered, right? So no matter what sample that I get of size linear in N, uh, size n, any labeling that I get. So any sample that I get with any labels, there's going to be some half space that that uh, achieves that labeling, right? So for example, yeah, in the Gaussian, this is going to occur with probability one. With probability will probability one, I sample a set of points that is that agrees with some half space. Um, so this seems to mean that testing should require at least n plus two points. Right, because no matter what I sample, there's some half space that agrees with it, so I don't see uh, any reason why it shouldn't be a half space. Um, but this is not the correct answer. And the reason why is that this works for one sided error. Uh, so this argument works if our algorithm must accept half spaces with probability one. And this means that we must see proof. We have to see proof that it's not a half space um, in order to reject the function. And that requires this. Uh, this lower bound here of, of n, but we're concerned with two-sided error. We're allowing our algorithm to make false positives and false negatives, in which case we don't actually need to see proofs. We only need to see evidence. We only need to see something in our samples that is unlikely if it was a half space. Um, and so just as an example of this kind of phenomenon, we can look at the prior work on testing half spaces. Uh, so here, um, uh, there was a result that said, for the uniform distribution uh, over the hypercube, or for the Gaussian distribution over uh, the reals, uh, you only need a constant number of queries to test half spaces. Um, and then later, uh, uh, Eric and some others uh, proved that in the Gaussian distribution, even if you only want samples, you still only need square root n samples. So this is in contrast to the Gaussian case for learning, where you need a linear number of samples. Uh, and then later, I also showed that if even if your distribution is unknown, so it's sort it's like pseudo distribution free, where it's unknown but still rotation invariant, so like the Gaussian, then you still need roughly only square root n samples. So you get much better than uh, this linear number um, that you would need for for one sided error. So here, two sided error we can see actually helps quite a lot. Uh, but this doesn't really help us with the distribution free case. And in all these cases, the distribution uh, is um, fairly restricted. Uh, so what we're going to do here in this work is we're going to say, well, for one sided error, we need to see proof of non membership. 
for two-sided error, we only need to see evidence of non-membership. And our goal is going to be to say that when the proofs, when the required size of the proofs are very large for non-membership, then we also need fairly large samples uh, to count as evidence. Um, so the starting point here should be, we need to quantify the number of samples that are required to find the proof. So in order to show this, we first have to look at this left side here and say, well, what do we need to show that large proofs are necessary? Um, so remember for half spaces, we needed VC dimension plus one points in general position uh, to prove that we're not a half space. Uh, so the first question we should ask is, well, okay, is this always true? Uh, is this VC dimension always what's necessary for the proof? Uh, and the answer is no. Uh, so one nice example is that of monotone functions. So a monotone function is defined over a partially ordered set. Uh, and the VC dimension is the width of that post set. So if you have an anti-chain in the post set, so a number of uh, points that uh, have no order between them, to prove that your function is not monotone, you would only need two points. You would just need an X point that's less than a Y point, uh, but where the function is greater on Y than it was on X. So you never need uh, more than two points to prove that you're not monotone. Uh, even though the VC dimension could be very large, the whole width of the, the partial order. Uh, and a really extreme case uh, that's kind of helpful to think about is when the hypothesis class H is actually just the set of all functions. Um, when it's the set of all functions, the VC dimension is you know as large as possible. It's, it's infinite if you have an infinite domain or it's the domain size. Uh, and testing is just trivial here. You don't need any samples at all. Uh, you can just say yes all the time. Um, so VC dimension is, is not really what we're looking for here. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to define a new thing uh, called lower VC dimension. Uh, that's what we called it. Uh, we're not aware of any other name that it's been given in the literature, but it is a very natural definition. Um, so if we look at what we need to prove non-membership, uh, we need that that set, this proof is not shattered, right? So we're going to define this lower VC dimension as the maximum number so that every subset of the domain of that size uh, is shattered, okay? So VC dimension, remember, said there exists a set of size K that's shattered. Lower VC dimension says all sets of size K are shattered. Okay, so a proof must satisfy uh, this inequality. It must be at least the lower VC dimension. Okay, but there's a problem here. Let's think about half spaces again. If I just have three points in a line, this is not shattered by half spaces. I could have a one, zero, one, right? Um, and that will never be realizable by a half space. So by this definition here, it looks like the lower VC dimension should be two because uh, we have a set of size three that's not shattered. Uh, so we want to fix this problem and this is going to be uh, an important change. Uh, we want to be able to choose a set S that's a subset of the domain and restrict our definitions to that subset. So the lower VC dimension uh, of this subset S is the maximum size, uh, the maximum K so that every set of size K that's a subset of S is shattered and the VC dimension restricted to S uh, is again the same thing max K uh, so that there exists a subset of S of size K that is uh, shattered. So now if we return to half spaces, uh, now we can pick S to be in general position so that we avoid these annoying uh, situations where they could be uh, on a line or on some very small dimensional uh, subspace or something. Uh, and then when we restrict to this S, we have what we want, which is that this lower VC dimension is actually equal to the VC dimension. Uh, so the required proof size uh, is what we had talked about before, which is um, uh, equal to the VC dimension. Uh, so now that brings us to our main result. Uh, so remember our goal is to prove that if proofs of non-membership are very large, 
then the amount of evidence or the size of a sample that provides evidence of non-membership must also be large. Uh, so this is the simplified uh, version of our main theorem. Uh, so let's go through what this says here. Uh, this S, which remember we've chosen uh, sort of to avoid those annoying small proofs. Uh, if we can find such a set S that's larger than the VC dimension, so five times the VC dimension, uh, let's say, uh, this is a somewhat arbitrary, but it, it, there's some restrictions on this number, but it's, it's somewhat arbitrary. Um, so if we can find a, a large set that's larger than its own VC dimension, so larger than the VC dimension restricted to S, uh, and the proof is large relative to the VC dimension. So this, the particular quantity here won't be important, but the, the VC dimension is large, uh, sorry, the lower VC dimension is large relative to the VC dimension then the sample size that's required for two-sided error testing uh, is this, it's omega uh, lower VC dimension squared divided by VC dimension log VC dimension. Okay, so here we can see what, what, what we wanted to show, uh, which is that when the L, LVC is very large relative to the VC dimension, then we get good lower bounds uh, on this sample size. Uh, so let's go to uh, some examples. So we already talked about hat spaces. So if we just plug in these numbers here, uh, S is that set. It's in, in general position. It's large. It's much larger than its own uh, VC dimension. Uh, then we get a lower bound of N over log N. So we've answered uh, that, uh, almost answered. <laughs> we've almost answered that first, uh, that, or that basic question that I talked about earlier. Uh, so we get a nearly uh, linear lower bound. Uh, so it's linear up to this log factor. Uh, so that makes us pretty happy. Um, but now let's look at monotone functions. What happens? Uh, well, we can find a set uh, S where this lower VC dimension is equal to the VC dimension. And again, this could be an anti-chain. Uh, but we, we need it to be, we, for, to apply the theorem, we need it to be larger than the VC dimension. The set S must be larger than the VC dimension. Here, if we choose a, an anti-chain as our set S, uh, it's the size is equal to the VC dimension. Um, and in fact, so, so that's not sufficient to apply the theorem. Uh, and uh, if we choose any set that's larger than the VC dimension for monotone functions, it actually goes back to having LC, LVC uh, two. So here our theorem doesn't apply. And in fact, we can get, uh, I think it's an order of square root VC upper bound. Uh, so in some sense, this condition is necessary. So I just want that to be an example why uh, why we need this condition here that the set we choose is actually larger than uh, the VC dimension. Um, okay, so now let's simplify this even more. Let's look at this really special case, uh, like half spaces, where the lower VC dimension, we can find a set S where that's actually equal uh, to the VC dimension over the whole uh, domain. Uh, so when this happens, we just get a lower bound of VC dimension divided by log of the VC dimension. Uh, and this is this is not restricted to S here. This is just over the whole uh, domain here. Uh, and so a question that that's really interesting here that uh, is is this log VC necessary? Right. We we know that we get an upper bound of the VC dimension. Now we got a lower bound with this log of the VC dimension below there. Is that necessary? Can we hope to improve this just to the VC dimension uh, in this special case where we where this lower VC dimension is uh, equal as, as big as possible. Uh, and maybe a surprising answer is that no, we can't improve this in general. Uh, so this log VC in the denominator is actually necessary uh, in some cases. So if we take, for example, the set of functions on domain uh, one to n, where the number of one values of the function is at most n over pi, uh, then testing this class, testing this property of functions actually requires n over log n samples, uh, upper and lower bound. Uh, so the lower bound comes from our lower bound here. The upper bound actually comes from prior work of Goldreich and Rahm. Um, but what about for other things like for half spaces? Uh, and we don't know the answer to this. So this log in the denominator we know it's sometimes necessary. We don't know when it's necessary or not. So for half spaces, maybe it is necessary, maybe it's not necessary. So uh, that's still an open problem. Uh, 
Uh, okay, so now let's move on to the proof of this bound. Uh, and the first ingredient for the proof of this bound is a reduction from the support size distinction problem, uh, which is not a property testing problem, but it's a, it's a distribution testing problem. So it's testing a property of a distribution instead of a function. Um, and so this is the definition of that problem. So we're, we have a natural number n, and then we have these two parameters, alpha and beta, uh, between 0 and 1. And I'll say SSD, the support size distinction uh, problem, is we get samples from some probability distribution uh, over the numbers 1 to n, uh, where every element has density either 0 or at least 1 over n. So uh, there's some lower bound on the probabilities within the support. And our goal is to output 1 if the support is smaller than alpha n, and 0 if the support is larger than beta n. So our goal is to distinguish between distributions that have small support size and large support size. Uh, and this is the decision version of a fairly standard problem in distribution testing, which is a support size estimation. Um, and for this problem, we have a tight theta of n over log n bounds uh, due to valiant and valiant. Um, but for our purposes, it was more uh, convenient to adapt uh, another lower bound of Wu and Yang, uh, which applied to some more parameters, a wider range of parameters. Um, and so the theorem that we get that, that's uh, just adapted from this result of, of Wu and Yang is that when, when the alpha and beta satisfy uh, some condition here that we don't have to worry about right now, uh, then this problem requires omega of n delta squared over log n. And delta is just how far away these parameters are from, uh, so alpha, how far away is it from zero? Beta, how far away is it from one? Uh, so that's this delta, delta here. Uh, so this is what's gonna give us our lower bound that we want. So we see the n over log n, which is, uh, going, to, going to give us uh, what we want. Oops. Uh, okay, so now this is a very brief uh, one, one slide summary of the whole proof here. Um, we want to reduce this support size distinction problem to property testing, uh, which means that we want to say that if we have a testing algorithm for whatever class that is of interest to us, we want to use this to distinguish distributions with small support versus distributions with large support. And so for uh, example, we're going to look at the class of K alternating functions. So these are just functions in one dimension that change from zero to one or one to zero at most K times. Uh, so this here on the bottom of this picture, that's going to be our one dimensional function. Uh, and on the top, this is going to be our uh, our probability distribution, and we want to we want to check if the support is small or if the support is large. So this is going to be our reduction. It's very simple. We're just going to take n this numbers one to n and just map them into the set S that we've chosen. Uh, then we're just going to choose a random function uh, on S, and then uh, transform samples uh, from our input distribution into samples from this set S that we've chosen, and then just run the tester. Uh, so if we look at the K alternating functions, let's say K is uh, six, I think six works for this example. Uh, then if we start with a small distribution, let's say a distribution that's size at most six, then if we map it onto S, it's definitely gonna be a six alternating function uh, inside that set and outside, this distribution here, this phi uh, distribution, has zero probability mass. Our whole support of our distribution just gets mapped onto this set of size six. And so we can basically ignore everything outside and say, yeah, that's a six alternating function inside there because the set is at size of most six. So it, it just has to be. Um, and then on the right, if we have a large support, then this gets mapped to a very large subset of S and this function down here is random. It's very unlikely that this set down here, uh, that this function down here is going to be six alternating, 
right? Like let's say this support is size 12 or something. It's very unlikely that we're gonna get a six alternating function down here. Uh, so that means that if our support size was small, we should get, a, we should end up, uh, the tester should end up saying yes here. And if it's large, then the tester should end up saying no here. Uh, so let's just go through how we prove that. Uh, so what we have, a tester for our class, and we have this set that we've chosen, S, that's very large compared to the VC dimension. Uh, and we have this LVC size, which should be thought of as large compared to the VC dimension. Um, and our input is this probability distribution P, and we want to construct this function so that exactly what we want uh, holds, which is that if the support is small, then the tester is going to accept. And if the support is large, then the tester is going to reject. Uh, so let's look at this first problem here. The support is small, means that F should be accepted by the tester. Uh, now, we have this property that every set, every subset of S with that's smaller than this uh, lower VC dimension is shattered. Um, and so when we map this small support, when we map this distribution onto S with small support, the support of that new distribution is going to be shattered. Uh, and that means that no matter what function I pick, I just picked a random function, but it doesn't matter which function that I picked, it's going to have distance zero under this distribution. Um, because it's shattered, we can fill in everything outside with whatever we want. It's going to have distance zero. It's only different on points that have no probability mass. So this is a little bit subtle. We're not constructing F that's actually in H. Our random function may not necessarily be in H, um, but it has distance zero to H. And that means that the tester has to accept it because the tester uh, only gets to see samples. So the tester just has to accept anything that's distance zero because it only gets to see samples. Um, okay, so that's, the, that's part one. Part two, we want to show that anything of large support, this random function should be far from our, our class and therefore be rejected by the tester. So we have this, this set is large, right? This is where we're gonna use this fact that the set is much larger than the VC dimension. Um, and so what we're going to, what we need to do is we have to say when we have this large support, so the support gets mapped to some large subset uh, under this mapping, and this large subset, we want to show that our random function that we've chosen is far from the hypothesis class with high probability. And here we go to one of the really fundamental facts about VC dimension, which is the sour shell off pearls lemma. Uh, and this lemma tells us essentially how many possible functions there are uh, in the hypothesis class. Uh, so it says that the number, or, or, or rather not the number of functions, but the number of possible labelings that are realizable on a set. So, um, so I, I'll skip the details here, but it, it really says that if you have a set that is, that is larger than the VC dimension, then it gives an upper bound on the number of possible labels that are realizable by that, uh, by that hypothesis class. And so basically, as we increase our size above the VC dimension, it's going to become more and more unlikely that a random function uh, is realizable by our, by our hypothesis class. And by extending this kind of argument, we can show that as you go up uh, to this large multiple of the VC dimension, um, you'll not only be unlikely to be in the hypothesis class H, but you'll be very unlikely to be even epsilon close to the hypothesis H. So just using this, uh, this kind of argument here, we can show that with very high probability, a random function is going to be uh, very far from the hypothesis class. Um, now there's a slight little problem here, which is that it's going to be far in the uniform distribution. We need to turn that into far in this unknown distribution P. Um, but luckily the distribution uh, testing problem uh, requires that the density of every point is at least one over n. And so we have a lower bound on these densities, which lets us uh, translate uh, the result that we want. So we get that this random function is far from the hypothesis class with respect to this unknown probability distribution p. 
uh, with very high probability. Uh, and so just to summarize the reduction again, uh, we have a distribution over uh, this domain one to n. Uh, we map it into this special set S that we've chosen. We assign random labels to that uh, and we run the tester. And then if the support size was small, then a random function must be accepted because it's essentially indistinguishable from something in the class. And if the support size was large, then our random function is very far from H using this uh, sour shallow pearls lemma. Okay, so that's an overview of our main uh, result, our general result. And so the idea with this result is that we should be able to reduce the problem of finding lower bounds uh, for, for testing to this other more combinatorial problem of just finding a set S that satisfies the conditions that we want. So here I'll talk about some examples where we find this uh, set S that satisfies the conditions that we want, which is that it has a very large lower VC dimension uh, relative to the VC dimension. So for half spaces, we saw that this is actually really easy. We just choose S to be any set in general position. Um, but is it that easy always? Like, let's look at some other uh, classes of functions. Uh, I'll just see what I'm doing for time. Uh, okay. So other classes of functions. So one really interesting class of functions is uh, intersections of half spaces. Uh, and so if we have half spaces one through K, an intersection of those, if we just take the and of all those things. Um, and this is, for example, like a polytope or something like that uh, with K faces. Uh, and the VC dimension is theta of n K log K, uh, where n is the dimension of the space. Uh, and what we're gonna do, so we want to find a set S where the, lin uh, the lower VC dimension is close to the VC dimension on that set. We won't quite achieve n K log K, uh, but we'll get close. So what are we going to do here? This is a nice little trick. We're going to just choose for any uh, real number z, we're going to take this n-dimensional point where we just take z to the first n powers. Uh, and this is uh, really nice because, so for example, in two dimensions, we get this, uh, we get this line uh, and we transform an intersection of k half spaces into, uh, into a a polynomial threshold function. So every half space becomes a one dimensional polynomial threshold function. Uh, so we can see that one half space, one line here, uh, just becomes on this uh, sort of, you imagine this curve as a one dimensional space here. So every half space becomes a degree one uh, polynomial threshold function. And then when we take the intersection of the half spaces, we get a degree kn uh, polynomial threshold function. Uh, so, so as you see on this one here, on this parabola, this intersection of two half spaces becomes a function that can alternate at most four times, right? So this nice little trick lets us say actually intersections of half spaces are equivalent to nk alternating functions um, which remember I was using as an example in the main reduction. Uh, so here we get that on this special set, the, the lower VC dimension is equal to the VC dimension, which is equal to NK plus one, which is what it was for the NK alternating functions. And we get our lower bound of NK over log NK. So still not quite, uh, we, we don't get, uh, this, this VC dimension that we get here is not quite the, the full VC dimension of the space, but it's still enough to get us uh, lower bound as optimal uh, up to the logarithmic factor here. Uh, okay, so now what about Boolean functions? So for this, for half spaces here and for intersections of half spaces, uh, we've been thinking about the domain as Rn. Um, but we are also very interested in, uh, oops, we're also very interested in Boolean functions. So functions that uh, are defined only on the hypercube and we can see that uh, uh, we can't just take S to be what it was before. We can't choose S to be a set of points in general position because the hypercube is very far away from being in general position. We're very restricted in what we can choose S to be here. Uh, so we get around this 
by just saying, well, okay, we're just going to pick S to be random. Uh, so then we can use this uh, theorem that says, uh, that says a random set of the hypercube is going to be linearly depend independent with high probability. Uh, and then in doing so, we can recover this n over log n bound. Uh, so here we're doing something. Uh, we're not exactly using our main theorem here because our main theorem has this deterministic uh, reduction in it. But we can replace that with this randomized reduction. So uh, we just choose a random set um, and then repeat the reduction. And uh, we can recover that original n over log n bound. So this is kind of cool. We get, uh, we get that this sample-based testing still requires the same complexity, even if you're just talking about the hypercube. And this random reduction will also work for degree k polynomial threshold functions. Uh, so I won't go into detail about this one, but polynomial threshold functions, uh, you can actually just uh, raise the dimension of the space uh, and make them equivalent to half spaces. So sort of by doing the same thing, we can, we can end up with a degree k polynomial threshold function bound. Um, so now I'm gonna talk about another application uh, which is slightly different. So this is a, an application that is, uh, it's not exactly testing functions. So up until now, I've been talking about testing Boolean valued functions, but we can also apply this to this slightly different case where we're actually just doing uh, distribution testing. Uh, so what radius clustering is, is we get samples from some distribution P. And what we want to know is if there are K unit balls uh, that cover the support of the distribution. So is our whole distribution essentially contained within k clusters uh, of, of unit balls? Uh, so we output one if that's true, and we output zero if uh, the total variation distance to any k clusterable distribution is at least epsilon. Uh, so there's an upper bound of nk log k for this problem. Um, so this was originally studied uh, in this paper here. Uh, but then uh, they got a slightly worse bound, I think it was nk log nk. Um, but using more modern VC dimension techniques, uh, it's pretty easy to get uh, uh, nk log k from that. Uh, and now for the lower bound, we actually can obtain an, an again, almost optimal, so optimal up to log factors, uh, lower bound here. Uh, and by, by constructing it in this way, uh, so we have k spheres, uh, unit spheres of radius one, uh, sorry, not radius one, one plus delta for some very, very small delta, uh, big enough so that two points on the opposite side of those spheres cannot be in the same cluster. Okay, uh, so sorry, I think that should be a two plus delta because the radius is one. Um, and now what we're going to do is we're going to say if we have a small support, uh, then we're going to map, uh, we're going to construct our set S essentially by, by choosing random points. So choose a sphere at random and then choose a random point on that sphere. And what happens is that if the distribution has very small support, uh, then the points that we get, there's not going to be very many of them on any of the spheres. Uh, and when there's not very many, then we can show that with high probability they're contained within this radius one uh, ball uh, on every sphere. Whereas if the distribution was large, uh, the original one in our distribution testing problem, uh, then the random set that we get is going to have uh, some of these spheres with too many points on them. And if there's too many points, then we're gonna have some like this where we can't put those two in the same sphere. And so we have to use more than one sphere uh, to cover this. Uh, and then we get that the total variation distance is going to be large. So using the same ideas, not exactly the same because we're not talking about functions anymore. We're just talking about distributions. But using the same ideas, we get a similar reduction that says uh, that, says that um, if you could test this k cluster ability, uh, then you could distinguish small from large supports. Uh, so now here's just a quick slide that shows a summary of our other applications. Uh, so I, uh, so unions of k intervals, that's basically the same as k alternating functions. Uh, so we get k over log k, lower bound for that. We talked about half spaces. We talked about intersections of k half spaces. Uh, for degree k polynomial threshold functions, um, 
we actually can get a bound on this using something called uh, these analytic Dudley classes. So analytic Dudley classes is, is a kind of a wide class of functions that are defined analytically. Uh, so like unit balls or like degree K polynomial threshold functions and using some results from some other work, uh, we can show that the lower VC dimension can be equal to the VC dimension uh, for, uh, for some large enough set and then get the lower bound for PTFs. Um, size K decision trees, which I didn't define here, but uh, uh, we can get, so for this one, actually the VC, the upper bound on the VC dimension, I think we didn't find an upper bound for that, but uh, the K over log K, we can get a lower bound for. Um, and then for the Boolean, we get hat spaces, degree K PDFs, and again, size K decision trees. This one looks a little bit weird, but, um, uh, and then we have just some brief applications to some other classes, like these so-called maximum classes. But this is where this sour shell off Pearl's lemma is tight. And in those cases, we get LVC equals VC for large enough sets. And another last application here is this uh, testing feasibility of linear constraints, which is a recent model uh, LP type testing of uh, this Epstein and Silwall uh, last year. Uh, and this is kind of interesting to mention because for this application, it's actually required that the, that the distributions that we use are uniform over their support, or rather that they have uh, integer valued uh, probability masses. So in order to get lower bound here, we need um, extra conditions on the probability distributions that we use. And so for here, instead of using the support size distinction problem uh, as, the, as the tool, we can use um, something called the distinct elements problem, which is, it's just the same problem except for that everything is required to be integer, uh, uh, integer values. Um, so for that, we don't get quite as good of a lower bound. So there's not quite as, as good a lower bound known for the distinct elements problem as for support size distinction, uh, but we still get nearly optimal lower bounds uh, for these kinds of problems. Uh, so just a brief mention of some open problems here. Um, I mentioned this VC over log VC. We know it's tight sometimes. We don't know when exactly it's tight. So in particular, is it tight for half spaces? Maybe there's a VC dimension, so a linear and N lower bound for half spaces, or uh, what would be really cool is if there's a VC over log VC upper bound for half spaces. That uh, would also be very interesting. Um, and our tightness result where this is necessary, that only holds for this case where the lower VC dimension is equal to the VC dimension. Uh, and so it'd be interesting to know when it, other examples where this is tight or maybe it's not tight. And kind of on a related note, when this lower VC dimension goes lower. So this requirement that we had in our theorem uh, that the, the lower VC dimension is, you, you know, larger than this function of the VC dimension. This comes from that uh, support size distinction lower bound, the requirement on the parameters there. Um, and so it'd be also interesting to study some classes with more mid-range values of this lower VC dimension. Uh, and uh, that's all. Uh, Nathan, I, so in in the sense, <clears throat> so but this LVC that you do you, you define also, you need a particular set, right? So, are there like good enough sets for which, like for a natural problem, are there like because you're saying right there, we were interested in natural problems, mm -hmm. and then we also want like nice enough sets, like sets that don't have these kind of singularities for whatever class of functions. Mm -hmm. Um, so are there sets for which this example in three like hold, uh, holds? Um, Look, this inequality, this bound that you're... I, I'm not sure. Uh, are, you, are you asking, sorry, are you asking, are there like natural classes where we can find a set where this holds? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Or where the best set that we can find this holds? Uh, either one is okay with me. Yeah, I just wanted to know if they exist for natural problems. Like, if uh, this okay, I'm not. I'm not absolutely certain, but I would say, because you have, you can choose whatever s you want. So I think it might be possible to say, okay, this this is going to hold for some s that you can choose. Right. Um, 
but we really want we really want to to sort of maximize LVC relative to VC. So then I'm not sure if this holds for any natural classes uh, where you're trying to maximize this LVC. Um, I see. Okay. Uh, so yeah, that'd be interesting. I mean, I, I'm not an encyclopedia of the natural uh, <laughs> classes, so I, I don't particularly I don't know any off the top of my head, but. Yeah, I, that's an interesting question. Like, can this even happen? I don't know. Okay, yeah. Nathan, this is really nice work. I like it. Um, Thanks. Uh, in terms of your uh, table, you have this table with all these lower bounds. Uh, may, maybe said it, but I might have missed it. Which of these lower bounds are like, uh, are, are these like all new or are any of them sort of matching previous work or how, how much do they improve previous lower bounds? Oh, uh, all new. Um, and I don't know any previous lower bounds, non-trivial lower bounds. So, uh, so for, uh, you know, for this model, this model is super weak, the distribution free sample based testing. So any lower bounds for any other models basically carry over here. Um, but um, I, I, like those lower bounds aren't very good that carry, like for example, like the square root N for testing half spaces in the Gaussian, that there's a lower bound uh, in, I think Eric's paper, there's a lower bound there. That's a square root N is necessary in the Gaussian. So then we get a square root N lower bound for half spaces, um, but that's not that great. Uh, so yeah, so all of these bounds are new and for all of them, I don't know a comparable one in the literature. I don't think there are any. I see, that's really nice then. This seems like the first like significant step in terms of lower bounds in this uh, direction. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah, and I guess that's kind of surprising, right? Because, uh, I, like I said, this is the weakest model. So it seems like it ought to be the easiest to prove lower bounds in, I guess. Um, but, yeah, apparently that's not the case, or nobody's done it. Sure, I guess. Um... Uh, I should actually, I should mention, sorry, uh, that there, there are some lower bounds. Uh, for some functions that are not Boolean functions. Uh, so there have been recent work, I think uh, uh, Ron and Rosen have a couple of recent papers showing lower bounds for uh, K alternating functions and um, something else uh, that are lower bounds in the distribution free sample based model of testing, uh, but the functions are not Boolean valued. Um, and uh, and I don't, and like they don't really correspond to natural learning problems, I guess. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, great talk, Nathan. Uh, nice presentation. Uh, very interesting result. I just wish uh, your proof could go a bit slower. I feel like if you go just a little bit slower, I could completely understand. So oh, once you complete sorry. the slide, if you give me 10 seconds to, to read the slides again, then I could I could completely understand. So that's my only comment. 